Luke chapter 3, verses 15 through 17 and 21 through 22. Listen for God's word to us. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. So I want you to imagine yourself down by the river that day. Who was there? Hundreds of people gathered from all quarters of Judea and Jerusalem. People looking for a fresh start. People searching for something beyond the flat, tired experience life had become for them. Broken people, curious people, disheartened people from all social strata, hoping against hope that John could clean them up and turn things around in their lives. People like you and me and those in our own nation today, eager to turn over a new page, hopeful that a new political culture will take us in a new direction. None of those there had any illusions of their innocence. How could you? After someone like John calls you a viper and you stay around to respond. These were people looking for something more in their lives. And then Jesus gets in line with them. The crowds don't part to let Jesus go first. He simply took his place in line with all the others and waited his turn. Now, some people might wonder, why would Jesus submit himself to John's baptism? We know it was a baptism of repentance. Wasn't Jesus supposed to be perfect, without sin? Why is Jesus being baptized? But it's with these, isn't it, with whom Jesus would spend his entire earthly life in the midst of sinners befriending them, eating with them, talking with them, healing them, loving them, calling them, giving his life for them? Why should his baptism be any different? Jesus went under the waters of the Jordan as others had, under the waters his ancestors had crossed after 40 years of wilderness wandering. He was called Emmanuel, God with us. And apparently, God's being with us meant God's being in the river with us. In the flesh with us. In the sorrows and messiness of life with us. As we come 
to remember our baptism and Jesus' baptism this morning. This is the first connection I'd want us to make. The people Jesus refused to be separated from at the Jordan are you and me. The whole lot of us. We're all sinners. Flawed, failed, and at fault, who yearn for something more. This is a piece of our true identity, who we are, people in need of grace. God, in Jesus Christ, has chosen to draw alongside such people. Not back off, but come close and seek to save and heal. Jesus is not afraid to attach himself to us or our frailties, to walk with us through the muddy waters of our lives into a fresh start. God comes alongside and claims us as his own with all our shortcomings, all our foibles, all our frailties. In that state, we're not left alone, we're not left bereft, but we are claimed by God. As you come forward in just a few minutes, remember the one to whom you belong, the one who is alongside you for your entire journey. But then notice the tremendous affirmation of worth that takes place at Jesus' baptism and our own. How can we miss it, right? God says, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Before the first leper was ever healed or a a single parable was told, before the storm was calmed or he set one captive free or the palm branches were cut and waved, God tore open the heavens and said, you are my beloved child with whom I am well pleased. And that is the same declaration and affirmation God makes and you and I receive at the very beginning of our own Christian journey as children of God. You are my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. Our lives I preached it hard a couple weeks ago, didn't I? Our lives begin and end in God's love. Whether you were baptized at six or 60, whether you were sprinkled or you were dunked, God was breaking open the heavens, reaching out for you and saying, you are my daughter, you are my son, you are mine. Your source of life and destiny are in me. I knew and loved you before you were ever born. And now I am claiming you, calling you by name. I have placed you here in this time and in this context. You're not a homeless orphan in this world, nor are you someone who must desperately strive all the rest of your days to stay on my good side. You're already on it. You don't have to achieve your way into my acceptance or succeed your way into my approval. Let go of that notion that I can only be pleased with you because of your accomplishments. You are my child. I take pleasure in you because you are you and you are mine. Let your life be a response to my love and my presence. Hear it this morning, church, at the start of this new year. Hear it personally. Hear it deeply. Hear it as a community. You and I are a people irrevocably, irresistibly loved by God. This is the central truth of our humanity and our faith. 
And it is this that was declared at your baptism. But that's not all. There was the Spirit at the Jordan also. The heavens opening and the Spirit dove descended on Jesus. This was, this was Jesus' commissioning. His being set apart and empowered and sent for a purpose. It is as if the Spirit is saying, from now on, we have something special to do together. You see, half the message at Jesus' baptism and our own is that we're loved, but the other half is that we have work to do. And both these elements are important. The affirmation of God's affection and the invitation to join in God's work. We've got something special to do together, God says, and you have an important role. You are essential. At our baptism, we are claimed in love by God. We are named as God's daughters and sons, and then we are aimed to serve God's purposes. We're set apart to share in God's ministry in the world. We're invited into the priesthood of all believers, that great body of the people of God that God is gathering and uniting in a common vocation to serve God's kingdom. A kingdom that people from every race and nation, people who are concerned more about others than themselves, a people who work for justice, offer the hope that is in Christ, grows deep spiritually. We are claimed, we are named, we are aimed to the joyful task of winsomely bringing Christ's presence into the world that all will be attracted to Jesus and his way. This is our vocation. As Jesus rose from the chilly waters of the Jordan, the Spirit descended on him, a sign that God's continuing presence would be with him, guiding, directing, empowering him to be faithful to his calling and as a servant and a savior to humanity and as the Son of God. And at baptism, we too are given the Spirit, the same Spirit that led Jesus to the poor and needy, to the lost and the hurting, the Spirit who gave Christ eyes to see and value each human being as made in the image of his Father. The Spirit who prompted Jesus to confront the pride and pain and addictions that render us less than we were made to be. The same Spirit that enabled and ennobled Christ to live with love and courage and compassion is ours. The gift of God's Spirit God's continued and close presence in our lives is a gift that we receive at our baptism and we are reminded of today. But listen, uh, this is not a slam dunk. The waters of baptism are also risky waters. The very next chapter of Luke's gospel tells us of an attempt on Jesus' life as he lives out his baptism, his naming and claiming. And we begin to catch a glimpse of how dangerous baptism is to the reign of the status quo. How does an employer manipulate employees to do their bidding if it contradicts the employee's first allegiance to God who requires truth and faithfulness, and a Sabbath rest? How does a family that relies upon guilt and shame to control family members retaliate if one of the members begins answering to a higher authority, living out their acceptance and belonging that is no longer dependent on the approval of their family? Risky business. 
how does a culture bent on keeping us all amused with the trivial and banal compete for the attention and the affection of a people who already know their purpose and source of love? How does the marketplace get people to buy more and more if those people don't measure their value by the size of their house or the make of their car if those people follow a master whose orders are to give two coats away if you have one and see a neighbor in need? How does a government ignite patriotism that will make citizens willing to die for its nationalistic causes when those citizens seek to fulfill the will of God, whether it aligns with the will of the state or not. It's just risky business you and I signed on for. In baptism, we are deeply affirmed. We're given the spirit but we're also led into risky waters. Having just crossed the threshold of a new year, today we remember the Lord's baptism, and we're asked to think about the significance of our own, to examine whether or not our lives are in a posture of willing surrender, not perfection, but willing surrender or passive resistance. To recognize Christ standing by us with forgiveness in the midst of our burdened and muddy lives. Call to recognize and to invite anew the spirit of freedom and support to move in and through us and to remember that the God of the open heavens is joined to us and we to God in a bond of love and mission to all people. Now the choir is about to uh, sing an anthem as we receive uh, the morning offering. And as they do, I'd ask you to reflect on these truths. And in just a moment, we will join together in a litany of renewing our own baptismal commitments and vows.